uh, with distinguished guests, uh, esteemed uh, seniors uh, in the profession, uh, members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, members uh, from uh, other health, healthcare allied uh, uh, professionals. Uh, good morning and welcome all uh, to today's webinar on infection prevention control. Today is uh, part two of what that began yesterday. I want to welcome you all from wherever you are in the country. In the country. Ladies and gentlemen, I will request you probably, uh, yesterday I never did this, but I will request you probably to be able to let us know where you are joining us from so that we get to know uh, the scope of, uh, uh, of our reach today. Can we get uh, join into the chat box so that I can we can try and see where you are from? Join into the chat box. Text me. Uh, just write write where you're joining us from. Eh? I can see Dr. Hilary Geshoki. Uh, I, I hope that is Dr. Kago from uh, Gatundu Hospital. Kindly on the chat box. Kindly let me know where you're joining us from. We begin in the next. Uh, we begin at exactly 11:04. Uh, Dr. Catherine Jorogi is joining us from Nairobi Utawala. Uh, Santi Sana Dr. for joining us. Uh, we begin at exactly 11.04, so that we allow our, our esteemed panelists, uh, our distinguished panelists, to be able to uh, have a good time, uh, ample time on presenting to us. Asante Dr. Simon Wange from Nakuru County. Thank you very much. And Dr. Sakina Iqbal uh, from Karatina. Kindly, Dr. Sakina, pass our regards uh, to Dr. Kenneth Irongo in Karatina and Dr. Alison, uh, Dr. Ben Ogonji from uh, Siaya, Asante Sana Karibu, Dr. Bina Patel from Nairobi, Dr. Maggetto, Jack's Pharmacy in Kisi, Karibu Sana Daktari, and uh, all the way from Meru, Dr. Janice Mukami, uh, Asante Sana for joining us uh, this wonderful morning. Kindly, our dear, uh, uh, dear distinguished uh, attendees today, can you just tell us uh, on your chat box where are you are you joining us from we want to we want to have a scope of where we we're having uh where our pharmacists are from uh bill kisabuli from eldoret asante sana uh for joining us from eldoret we begin at 11.04 we only have one minute to uh Dr. Netia Netia, Karibu Sana Daktari, Asante Sana for joining us. Dr. Lili Kimohu, Asante Sana Molim for joining us. Professor Keegan, thank you very much for, for joining us, our senior. Asante Sana for making time to be with us this morning. Dr. Evans Makumba is joining us from uh, Naibasha County Referral Hospital. Asante Daktari for joining us. Eh? Dr. Sally Rungu, formerly uh, Tukana County. Asante Sana Daktari for joining us all the way. Uh, probably you're joining us from Nairobi, but you formerly, uh, she was formerly in uh, Tukana County. Ladies and gentlemen, without further much ado, I once again want to welcome you uh, to today's uh, webinar and training on infection prevention and control. Uh, this is in partnership by the, with, by the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, in partnership with uh, Gary Shonchege says I need to up my volume. Hope it is well, it is now well, Gary uh, This is in partnership with uh, USAID, the USAID Medicines Technologies and Pharmaceutical Services Program, that is MTAP's program. And this has been train, a training that has been going on also with other healthcare professionals. Now, this is the time for us as, as a pharmacist and a, a members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya to be trained on this. Uh, just a few a few uh, rules before we begin. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I, I will ask you all to ensure that esteemed members of the society that you subscribe to the event on the Pharmacy and Poisons Board portal. The event is up on the Pharmacy and Poisons Board portal. Remember that you cannot be awarded your points unless you have subscribed uh, onto the portal. Again, a CPD points will only be awarded to eligible uh, Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya members who are, whose membership is up to date, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you all remain muted uh, during this webinar. 
And without further much ado, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome our first our first panelist for today. I want to welcome our first panelist for today, uh, who is going to take us through who is going to take us through uh, environmental sanitation and uh, waste management. Uh, his name is uh, Peter Karega. His name is Peter Karega. He works at uh, Tigoni Hospital, and uh, he has uh, he has specific roles in, pro in in the training committee at uh, the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association. At the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Let's uh, be able to join in and uh, uh, participate well. Thank you very much, Dr. Angeline, for joining us. Uh, Dr. Angeline uh, Mwakira, thank you very much. So, Peter Karegwa, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bao. Peter? Yes, Dr. Ali, I can hear you. Yes, uh, Peter, so now I, this is your chance now to uh, speak one on one with the members and share what you have prepared for them. Asante uh, Sana, Peter, take, uh, take us through uh, what you have prepared for us today. Asante. Thank you very much for that. I hope uh, my PowerPoints are feasible. Just a minute, if you don't mind. Sorry for that. Doris. Peter, they're not visible from from your okay. side, eh? Okay. Let, let me try, let me try again, eh? Yeah. Let me confirm. Don't mind. It's on now. I can see it from my end. Thank you. Uh, the problem is that uh, they are not okay, great. Thank you. Hi, 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 all. My name is Peter Karegwa. Uh, from KPA. I will be taking you through this module. Uh, it's called uh, Environmental Sanitation and Waste Management. And it is its intention to prevent contamination and infection in our health facility. Uh, these are our expected learning outcomes that uh, at the end of this module, Alana should be able to define the environmental sanitation and hygiene. Uh, he or she should be able to describe the principles of environmental sanitation. He or she should be able to describe the waste management. And also, very important, uh, describe risk assessment and management. Uh, let's start off. And, uh, environmental sanitation refers to promotion of hygiene and prevention of diseases and other consequences of ill health attributed to environmental factors. So among all, the environmental factors are very key if you want to prevent contamination uh, and infection in our facility, as you promote hygiene and prevent the diseases and other consequences. Uh, this module has two components, that's environmental sanitation and also waste management. And uh, for waste management, these are all activities and actions involved in uh, manipulation of waste from the point of generation to disposal. From the time that you generate the, this, um, this waste up to the point that you dispose it, all these activities, and they are key role in preventing, preventing contamination and infection. And this is very key from our side as pharmaceutical, uh, in our pharmaceutical practice, because uh, we most of the times we end up uh, letting our supportive staff do this, we need to empower them and also support them with information. Because at the end of the day, if the contamination and infection comes from them, it will still add up to us. Uh, we'll start off with the environmental sanitation, uh, then a uh, 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 part of it, the other part will go to uh, waste management. And uh, these are key important uh, components of environmental sanitation which includes uh, housekeeping, laundry, food safety, 
and water safety. And as I said, these are the key things that can be a source of contamination and infection of facility, but most often we let it be done by our supportive staff. Uh, what is this housekeeping? And what's its role in, uh, in our prevention of infection and contamination in our facility? And we are saying it's a provision of clean, comfortable and safe environment for the patient and staff and the public. It's not only uh, providing clean, comfortable and safe environment for us, but also for the patient and the public who visit our environment. And we are saying our health facilities can actually be a source of contamination, not only to those who are heading to that facility, but even the environment. If you are having a pharmacy, know even that person who is doing other business next to you, you can be a source of infection and contamination. If it's a hospital, there are those uh, people that live around, you can also, even the road itself, you can also, the hospital or the facility can be a source of health and then contamination and infection. And this is a key point. Uh, part of the common housekeeping practices in, uh, in our key areas, that's uh, our health facility. You need uh, systemic cleaning operations. And I, sh I'll, uh, I'll uh, explain to about them later. You also need basic work procedures. You need to control others, pests and rodents and animals, very key, because this can be a source of infection and contamination in our facility. You also need to know how to waste money, which are these methods and procedures that we use, very key. Uh, also, we need safety regulation. You need to control the accident, fire and electrical mishaps in our facility. You need to take care of our furnitures, very important, but they can be a source of infection and contamination. In our facility, be it the pharmacy or the hospital, the interior decoration, very important. It can be a source of infection and contamination. Also our storage procedures for used equipment. When we are done with what we use, or it's no more, uh, no more important to us, where do we store them? All those things can be a source of infection. Let's go to the systemic cleaning operation. And they are key because we are supposed to make sure that they are done, even if we are, we are not the one who is doing it, we are supposed to make sure they are done in the right way so that they not a source of contamination and infection. These are the key cleaning issues in a health facility. Uh, first one is the routine cleaning of environmental surfaces. And you are seeing it's done according to predetermined schedules, sufficient to keep the surfaces and, and uh, critical patient care items clean. You have a pharmacy. I know most of us, we, we have a uh, routine cleaning. Uh, maybe do we do it in the morning, do we do it in the evening, do we do it during the time? But you are supposed to do it so that we make sure that uh, either our, our, our place is not source of contamination and infection. We also have the hospital cleaning. Uh, and we are seeing that cleaning in all patient cares. We are, with a special attention to high risk areas. For example, I keep saying, I keep saying that um, if you are in a hospital, maybe we can say the casualty is more, has high risk areas and needs a lot of cleaning compared to our pharmacy. We also have a special cleaning, and this is uh, key to us because we already have an outbreak, maybe during this COVID, and uh, maybe during cholera, hemorrhagic fevers, patient rooms with multi-drug resistance organism, all this requires special cleaning. We cannot afford to do the normal cleaning. We need to put a, a little bit more attention. Also, the last one, we have a terminal cleaning. This is completed after patient transfer. When you are done with a patient, uh, before you let another patient to come in, you need to do the terminal cleaning so that you stop the spread of the contamination and uh, infection. Uh, we have key uh, common formulation of, uh, of cleaning solutions, and uh, they can come in form of powder. I know from our setup of pharmacy, we know we can, for example, a jig, you can get it from in the form of powder, and also you can get it in the form of a liquid. I'll explain how to come up with them to, to prepare solutions later. And our common types of cleaning solutions, uh, we have three of them. One is the most famous that have become so famous. Uh, this is 0.5 chlorine solution. Uh, and we are seeing part of the products that are, are made from, uh, these are the sodium hypochlorite. We have uh, calcium hypochlorite and also sodium dichloroisocyanulate tablets. Uh, there's also the ideal or isopropyl alcohol. <coughs> 
I know you have come across those searches that we use for disinfection and also which are good for preventing contamination in infection. We also have the phenolic germicidal detergents and solutions. Uh, an example of this is uh, maybe Detto. And also in our setups, uh, I have seen a lot of saffron. These are phenolic germicidal detergents solutions that we can use. How, like I said, we can uh, see on how to prepare these chlorine solutions. And there are two, two methods of preparing chlorine solutions. Key things here is to note that uh, <clears throat> as a health worker, you need to know that you can get uh, your, uh, your source of uh, your source of material or the chlorine that you want to prepare either in uh, different forms or in different concentrations. You can get it using chlorine powder and also you can get it uh, using chlorine liquid. Uh, but uh, something to note is that, uh, and this is very important to us and we should pass it to even the support staff that you are working with, that powder and tablet chlorine solutions might be pre prepared every 24 hours where liquid, Solutions are prepared after eight hours and stored in that container. Uh, and we are saying it's in that container because it's a uh, photosensitive, light sensitive, that is. And uh, for powder, at least uh, it has a little bit longer, uh, a long uh, lifespan for 24 hours. But the key one is this one that you are preparing using liquid solution. That in every eight hours, it's not effective anymore. How do we prepare? I know you have seen this, but it's good to remind ourselves that when you're coming up with the chlorine, chlorine powder, we are, we are using chlorine powder from the company. You have what you need uh, to come up with, and uh, you also have the percentage uh, of the powder from the manufacturer. So what we are saying, you can be able to, to come up with the grams of powder that you're supposed to uh, mix with the liters of water. So. The percentage that you want to come up with, you divide it with the percentage or the concentration for the manufacturer, then you multiply by 1000. With that, you get the grams, the number of grams that you, uh, you will uh, mix with each liter of water. For example, the common 0.5 solution, uh, we can uh, maybe uh, come up with it from the 35% chlorine powder from the manufacturer. And we are saying, you divide the 3.5% that you are desired to come up with and the 5% chlorine uh, that is coming from the manufacturer, you multiply by 1,000, you shall get a 14.2 grams. This 14.2 grams is what you will uh, weigh from uh, your, your uh, company source, then you mix it with each liter of water. So per every 14.2 grams, you'll mix it with uh, one liter. Then there, this one that you are preparing chlorine solution from chlorine liquid. <clears throat> and key thing that you are supposed to note here, uh, we are kind of interchanging because earlier before for the powder, we were saying that chlorine that we desire is what that is the numerator. But in this form, we are coming up with the, the percentage of chlorine liquid product from the, the concentration from the manufacturer is a numerator, you divide it with the chlorine desired as a denominator. And that you minus one. And what you are going to get different from the one that you came up with the powder, the grams, here you are going to get the total parts of, for each part of chlorine liquid. And for example, we, are, we want to prepare the same 0.5 chlorine solution from 3.5% chlorine liquid. And in this case, uh, we are going to take a uh, the 3.5 chlorine liquid, which is our concentration from the manufacturer, you divide by our desired percentage of the concentration, which is 0.5. What you get, and in this case, you are getting seven, you minus one. In that, you get six. So you take six parts of water, you mix with one part of chlorine liquid. If you have, uh, you want to come up with uh, seven liters, you'll uh, take six parts of water, that's six liters, you combine with one uh, liter of the liquid, so uh, liquid chlorine from the manufacturer. You can uh, uh, go through it later for more understanding. Uh, another key process of sanitation is laundry and linen processing. Like I said, these are key things that we let it be done by our support staff, but are key 
to if we need to contain infection and contamination spread in our facilities. Uh, uh, and we are saying contaminated and not linen can be a source of close infection. Appropriately processing reduces chances of hospital acquired infections. The layout of laundry should be should be should accommodate unidirectional flow of materials. They should not be mixer of the flowing. Uh, if the supportive staff is, is carrying those things, it should be unidirectional movement. Uh, there should not be confusion because this will be the source of uh, uh, contamination. And all use linen should be handled as potentially infectious uh, and should be, uh, be handled like a, a risk source. Segregation of used linen should be based on the degree of contamination. And also, always had to lean away from the body and with appropriate PPEs. These are the things that we learned, but uh, <clears throat> the, our supportive staff don't know this. And uh, they'll get this, they'll spread the, the, these infections to the whole facility. So it's very key, important that we should be ready to check on this. Uh, part of the steps in the lean processing, uh, you should be able to know that uh, you are supposed to segregate then transport, then stress. Stressing is uh, if uh, the, the linens are a little bit have solid particles, you should know how to remove them so that uh, you can be able to, to clean them accordingly. Then after you stress, you can clean and dry. But also key important thing that every time is good to check on the, on the impact of cleanliness and uh, repair and also those that need replaced, replacement should be done and later it should be that there should be storage. If you are in at management level, it's very key important things here that uh, you should make sure that uh, your facility is well coordinated and well set up so that all this can be can be managed well and should not be a source of infection in our facility. Uh, machine, wa uh, machine washing of soil linen. Like I said, you need to stress soil linen first. Then after rinsing the stress linen, wash as normal. So at least uh, you should not, uh, there's that confusion of washing those solid particles uh, before stressing. Also, heavy soil linen may need two cycles if not found physically clean. That's why we say that uh, it's very, very important that you check when you're cleaning these things, has it been done well? So that uh, it's not be assumed that it is clean and uh, it becomes the source of uh, uh, infection. And key thing to note is that uh, I've seen, uh, which has become very common that uh, of late we are using the some clothes from in the hospital. You can imagine like uh, where I work, you want to do it. And uh, these things, uh, the, the materials that you are doing with or the clothes are not well clean. I'm, uh, I'm putting them knowing that I'm preventing myself or protecting myself by the end of the day, there can be a source of infection and contamination even before I see that patient. So if this machine is not available, then it can be done manually. But key things, make sure that uh, those supportive staff, they support them, they are using uh, the PPEs, proper PPEs when they're doing this. Uh, functions of the, whole, of the hospital outdoor department, they are supposed to collect and or receive sort of infected linen. I know this kidding, these things have not been famous to us, but uh, with this pandemic of um, COVID, they are key things and we should be able to check on them. Uh, in this department, what they do, they collect and receive sort and infected linen. They process the sort linen through loud equipment. They inspect and repair the damaged articles and check the contamination. And also if they need to be, they replace. There's also distributing finished linen to the respective user department. This is why I'm saying uh, they might fail from their side uh, to do their part, but later they distribute it to you as a respective user. And you can imagine that how it can distribute the infection if not well managed. Also, there is maintenance of control of active and back of interventions for processed linen. Also, maintaining all types of registers for linen. Uh, we is kidding that we should know our users what we, the donning maybe the donning uh, linen that we have. All these registers should be kept, and they are this is a function of the hospital laundry department. Uh, 
uh, we have already gone through the housekeeping and the laundry. Now we go to the food safety. This is the practice that ensures that food is not chemically or biologically contaminated during harvesting, storage, transportation, and preparation and consumption. So all these activities from the harvesting to the storage, to the transportation, to the preparation and consumption are key things even in our facility and they can be a source of spread of infection and contamination. Uh, and we are seeing the epidemiology of foodborne diseases is changing with the new or unexpected pathogens often emerging. And the, these changes are attributable to several socioeconomic and demographic factors. And uh, we have uh, two fecal oral transmission sources. One is uh, the foodborne infection and the other one is foodborne in the detoxication. And you are saying for foodborne infection, this is an infection by the organism with the multiplication of toxin production in the host. In short, you are ingesting food that has life organism in it already. This can be when you, the food is not well cooked, you are ingesting that food that is have life organism. Different from the intoxication where growth in food source with toxin production before ingestion. And uh, we are saying that ingestion of food containing bacterial toxins due to bacteria growth. When you're ingesting this food, it might be having toxin. Different from the one that uh, for food uh, for foodborne infection, where you are in, uh, ingesting that organism. For this one, these are the for the intoxication toxins are the products of this organism. All this can be a source of uh, fecal or long transmission. Uh, hazard analysis of critical food control points. This is very key. And where I'm working from Tigoni uh, Level 4 Hospital, uh, we have seen uh, situations where health workers have been, been able to protect themselves from the point of uh, practice, from the point of doning, when they are seeing the patient, when you are doing all the other things. By the end of the day, we forget these key things of uh, when you are when you are having our food and sharing maybe a meal. And uh, we have seen uh, some, some of us uh, uh, getting the 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 the, the COVID uh, virus, uh, and we are saying that uh, the following key sites for food contamination. When you receive the food, we should support our our cooks when they are receiving it, when they are preparing it, when they are storing it, and when they are cooking it. They make sure that there is no spread because at the end of the day, these things will add up to us as health workers. Also, when you are serving and holding, I know these are. Uh, critical because at the end of the day, you cannot uh, have your food and uh, whatever you are taking with your mask, but it's key thing that we should not uh, dilute all the things that we have done when you are protecting ourselves, but we end up getting this infection when you are serving and holding the food. Also when cooling and also reheating, we, it can be a source of food. You can imagine when you're cooling your food, another a person in the hospital comes, cools it, we can spread it the infection. So sanitary facilities and equipment in the kitchen, an emphasis is required on the following areas. Uh, the cleaning and sanitation of the surfaces and equipment, very important. Pest control in that. I know sometimes we have those, um, those food that are stored there, the store, we need to control this space because they can also be a source of infection. Also a routine and best inspection of the premises to maintain required standard. And this is our, our law that we should make sure that in this kitchen uh, facility should not be a source of, we should, a source of infection. We should always have a best inspection and also make sure that the standards are better. Uh, that's an example of our don't kitchen staff because of the, as we are saying on our side we are trying to don't we are trying to make sure that we protect ourselves it's very important that we make sure that our kitchen staffs and our, those that are preparing our food for the patient and for the staffs have all this they don't well you can see uh, for our example here we have a, uh, that, that uh, cook has a hair cover she has an apron she has boots and cleaning clothes to make sure that uh, she is stopping the spread of the infection uh, lastly, we are going to go through the waste safety or the water safety, which is key. Like I said, we went through the housekeeping, went through the laundry, we went through the food safety. And finally, now we are going through the water safety. These are key things that sometimes you forget, but they are very important if you want to control the, uh, the, con the contamination and infection spread. 
and we are saying the correction, transportation, storage, and handling of water should be monitored frequently and consistently to avoid risk of contamination. Uh, and safe water can be purified by, you can boil, you can also, uh, so, and and we say that uh, when you are boiling, you should make sure that it boils. And these are the information that we should pass even to our supportive staff that the water should boil one to five minutes. And if it boils one to 20 minutes, it's even better off. Also, we have chemical treatment. This is where we, we discuss maybe we are treating with chlorine. And also, we have filtration, though I know filtration is not uh, so famous in our setup. Uh, these are components of water safety in our facility. And this applies even to our, even our pharmacy setup. What is our water supply? It should be reliable and continuously available for users. And these users here in our case, we are saying, it should not only be available for you, it should also be available for the workers, the patient, and also the visitors in the health facility. Make sure you have enough water and the supply is continuous and available. Also the water quantity and storage, and we are saying should be sufficient and free from contamination. Uh, like for example, the way we are saying, if that water is uh, uh, crawling, pro, uh, crawling up, um, uh, provided, it should be on a black uh, because it's on a black container because it's light sensitive. Else, the the treatment that we had done it should not be it will not be effective. Also, we have the water safety and water quality testing. Uh, Lane water, other ground water, chlorinated water is considered safe. Also, we have the water treatment options. Uh, and we are saying chlorination is the most effective and least expensive compared with boiling and filtration. Lastly, the components of, uh, uh, in our case, we have the waste management. And we are saying it refers to all activities and actions involved in the manipulation of waste from the point of generation. And you can imagine, according to WHO, 85% of waste generated by a healthcare setting is general, but an, an unhazardous waste. But 15% is potentially infectious, which can be can even spread beyond the health facility, like I said. Even our neighbors uh, can have, you can spread to them. And we are classifying this of waste, and we are saying waste can be classified either as hazardous and unhazardous. Unhazardous is waste which has not made contact with any infectious material. And in our case, maybe you have paper boxes, bottles, and plastic containers. That, but key things, if it's not, it's, if you have to consider it that as an unhazardous, uh, it should not have made contact with any infectious material. And two, we have hazardous waste. These are waste that contains infectious or potential toxic materials, e.g body fluids, pathological uh, materials, pharmaceutical materials, laboratory chemicals, and also radioactive materials. Uh, key steps in uh, waste management, uh, and I know this is very relevant to us as pharmaceutical, in our pharmaceutical practice, that first thing is waste minimization. We need to segregate. This is very key. That's at the point of generation. We need to segregate. Where do these, <coughs> these waste that we have generated supposed to go? Also, we need to see on how we hydrate and store it, correct, transport, treat, and dispose. Like for example, here on a, <coughs> on a pictorial demonstration here, you can see where we are trying to minimize. If you can use tablets, uh, that won't generate uh, bottles, you better do it. If you are able to recycle, do it. This will reduce un uh, uh, unnecessary, this is a point of waste minimization. Also for segregation, at a, a point of uh, generation, maybe in our pharmacy, we know that this, this waste is supposed to go to this bag, is supposed to go to this bag, even before we let it be handled by other supportive staff. You can see handling, storage, all these things. And maybe for the, on our site, maybe we can uh, we can be able to do part one and part two. But all the other uh, the other the other um, uh, steps, maybe we let it be done by other people. And we need to make sure that we follow it up, else it will be a source of infection. Also, we should be segregated at a point of uh, uh, generation, like I said, by all healthcare. And like I said. Um, 
uh, we, you can uh, segregate it in this form. Uh, I know this famous for us. General waste, we use black color and it includes maybe paper, packaging material and food. But we also have infectious waste that maybe include uh, ghost roll. We have dressing uh, materials. You have used IV uh, materials, fluid lines, used gloves and infusion set. All this should go to a yellow bin. Uh, and of course, should be should be, should include a liner inside. Also, we have the red color, and this red color goes for anatomic waste, maybe teeth, placenta, pathological waste, and a sputum container, test tube containing specimen. All these ones should go to a red color colored bin. Also, last year we have a uh, sharp waste. Uh, this one are like needles, scalpels, blades, all those on uh, broken ampules, all this should go to, to sharp waste. I know from our setup as a pharmaceutical practice, we also have the brown uh, for chemicals and pharmaceutical waste should go for brown. And also we have the purple that goes for uh, cytotoxic materials. Though these are the general one and the key one in our facility. Treatment of infectious material and waste management, we can do this, we can treat this through autocraving and shredding. Also, we can use chemical to disinfect. And lastly, we can incinerate. But key thing to note, not everything that is incinerated. Uh, we have pressurized gas containers, like aerosol cans. We are, uh, for example, the Ventolin one, and large amounts of reactive chemical, which should be incinerated for the pressurized gas containers the best thing is the best thing is to recycle you can uh, take it back to the to the company that provided us with the same and this is key because once you give this to patients we don't follow up where the patients are disposing these things we should have a, a, a continuous follow-up so that we know where they are doing it uh, if you cannot they are incinerated, you can actually, if you are not able to take it back to the companies, you can depressurize it, then you dispose as usual, as other, whatever, as other waste. Also, we have silver salts and uh, photographic and radio, uh, radiographic waste. This should also not be incinerated. We also have a plastic container for the phenyl chloride. Uh, and this one we should uh, microwave and shred. We should not uh, incinerate. Uh, lastly, we have waste containing high mercury cadmium content, for example, the broken thermometers, used batteries, lead linen, wood panels. I think the best one for this is uh, lead fuse. Uh, they are better off compared to incineration. You should not incinerate that. And uh, importance of waste management is that uh, we're increasing safety in our employees and also patients by reducing the potential uh, to sustain the sharp injuries. When we do, when we manage our waste well, we are protecting ourselves from even uh, sharp injuries. I have seen this when you have a broken ampule in our pharmacy and you don't have a sharp uh, waste uh, beam. You are more likely to be tempted to put it in our, in our normal way of uh, man managing waste or uh, disposing waste, which is, should not be done like that. Uh, also, it uh, reduces the risk of exposure to bloodborne pathogens and reduces hospital acquired infections. Uh, also, it minimizes cost of direct and indirect treatment as a result of hospital related injuries. So, when we do, we, waste, we manage our waste well, we are able to protect and minimize the cost that uh, might end up uh, messing up our, our facility staff. Lastly, but not least, uh, this risk assessment and uh, management in IPC, very important. And this is, I think, to my opinion, this is what we, we are supposed to start with when uh, we have learned this module. And also it should be continuous. First, you need to identify the problem. Where are these sources? Where is the spread of contamination coming from? You need to evaluate the problem. Also identify the infection risk. Where, where is the risk more likely to come from? Is it the casualty, is it the pharmacy? Or when uh, it's a pharmacy setup, is it when you are segregating it or is it when you are sending a supportive staff to go and do it for you? You need to identify this infection risk. Also assess the likelihood and severity. What's the sphere of this infection that you are getting from when you are, wasting, when you are managing this waste? 
Now, after you do that, you are supposed to implement the priority interventions. Do you empower your staff? Do you choose to do it yourself? All these are, do you provide these beans for the staff, uh, staffs, all the supportive staff? Do you empower your pharmacy uh, staffs on all these? And, but at the end of the day, you need to continually monitor this and evaluate if it's working. Uh, from my summary, is we should know that in our, the hospital, and in our case, the hospital and the pharmacy setup, maybe for those who are in, maybe in a private practice, that a hospital pharmacy environment is a source of many contaminated materials, instruments, and linen. And like I said, even if you have a pharmacy a practice and there is a person near, near you that is selling phones and other commodities, you can be a source of infection to them. And due to the high turnover of patients, you can imagine if you are in a pharmacy or the hospital, how many patients visit you. And due to this high turnover of patients, different conditions, uh, you become a very suitable environment for the growth of microorganisms that can be cross-contaminated to patients and the staff and also the visitors. Uh, and therefore, precaution is necessary to reduce contaminants and manage spread of pathogens and should be emphasized in all departments. Sometimes on our side, maybe we let it uh, loose on our side as pharmacy. We say this is maybe is supposed to be done at the lab level, laboratory level, or the casualty, or the ward, but even from all departments, it should be done. Thank you very much for listening to me. These are part of the references, and I know Doris will share with you. You can uh, check on it. Thank you very much for that, for listening to me. Asante sana, Asante sana, Peter. I have, I have uh, totally, it was an enlightening, it was an enlightening uh, uh, presentation. And probably on my own thoughts, eh? on my own thoughts, uh, these are we saying uh, the benefits of uh, waste management. I have seen this one benefit in matters environmental management. Uh, probably I will now put that in the question and answer uh, uh, section eh, to enable uh, the, this question to be shared with other members. So the esteemed members who had not joined us as we began, uh, I will remind you to kindly share your questions uh, on the question and answer. I can see Dr. Uh, Dr. Kennedy Opondo uh, has, is, is, has well been answered. Uh, so ensure that you put your questions on the Q&A section. We're going to go all, through all these questions. Eh? And also, if you have a, a query or a comment, eh, put it kindly. Put it on the chat box. We are going to respond to all these uh, to all these uh, res responses that you that you give us uh, for to, uh, for today. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Peter, uh, that's a very well answered. Uh, that's a very well uh, and elaborate uh, presentation. It was enlightening. It was indeed enlightening. The basics that we are with uh, in the community pharmacy daily. Uh, what we ignore on a day-to-day -day basis is what you've taken us through. So ladies and gentlemen, so that we can have ample time to respond to all the questions that we are going to get for today. And I ask you, please bring as much questions. Dr. Tom Sindani, my senior in the profession, kindly bring the questions from Western province. So bring all the waste management questions from Western province, uh, uh, from the Western uh, uh, region, Dr. Terry. So ladies and gentlemen, I will introduce the next uh, panelist uh, for today. Our next panelist is Dr. Leon uh, Gaku Ogoti. Uh, he is a member of the Kenya Medical. Uh, he is a member of the Kenya Medical Association. He is an infection uh, infectious disease uh, uh, physician. He's an infectious disease physician, physician, and a member of the Public Health Committee uh, with the Kenya uh, Medical Association. So, without further much ado, uh, let me welcome Dr. Leon Ogoti. Dr. Leon. Dr. Leon, can you hear me? Morning, Dr. As, yes, as I Karibu sana, Dr. Leon. And uh, as uh, our, our, our attendees are saying, that you can only give us, you can only take the bar higher in, to, uh, in regards to this training. Karibu sana, Dr. Leon. And uh, much honored to have you uh, present with us, uh, for, with us today. Asante sana. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and to the participants for joining us today. So I'll be taking you through healthcare associated infections. And uh, for healthcare associated infections, there are most times when patients come to our facilities, we tend to manage them for the conditions that they brought from outside. 
but we forget that many times we end up managing them for conditions that they acquire within the hospital. And this is a, a very high prevalence rate of between one, one to seven to one to 10 patients. We end up managing them for a longer time than they should have been in the hospital for infections that are acquired in the hospital, which is a very sad uh, situation. So today we are going to look at how we can address some of the issues that arise and contribute to development of infections within the hospital setup. Our objectives for today will be to define healthcare associated infections, to describe the common ones that we see in our facilities, to discuss the care bundles that uh, we can use at, our, at different levels to prevent these uh, healthcare associated infections, to describe surveillance, which is very important in control of these infections, and to describe the role of each one of us going forwards. So when you talk about healthcare associated infections, what, what are healthcare associated infections? These are infections that are in apparent on admission and occur within 48 hours of admission. So we give that uh, two, two day period for any infection that there was in the incubation period to manifest so that we don't wrongly refer to it as a H healthcare associated infection. Then we also give a period of up to 30 days after discharge for diseases with a longer uh, incubation period to manifest so that we can also attribute them to uh, having been acquired in the hospital. And these infections are acquired anywhere within the hospital premises. So it's not necessarily for out inpatients. Any part of the, any department which a patient visits even if it's as an outpatient and there's um, poor infection prevention, they are likely to pick something up from the hospital. So when we talk about healthcare associated infections, there are certain things that uh, predispose any individual in the healthcare facility space to acquiring an infection. So we look at some of them and you'll notice most of them are actually related to either immunity, immune status. So conditions within the patient that reduce the immune, immune status or related to surgical procedures within the hospital. These are actually the two most common uh, predisposing things. So when you look at uh, operation factors, these are within the surgical department. We see that we have uh, the type of procedure. So the type of procedure, of course, counts a lot because there are some procedures which end up taking long durations of time, or proce procedures which are very complex and end up causing a lot of damage to the tissues, which delays wound healing and increases the risk of developing an infection. Again, when we talk about con con contamination, level of contamination of the different wounds, we'll see the different classes in, our, in a later slide. But it's also very significant because these contaminated wounds are contaminated with pathogens which cause the infections. You talk about the surgeon's experience, more experienced surgeons are able to perform more skilled surgeries with less damage to the tissues and in a faster time. Which, or which save the patient from the risks of acquiring infections. Length of operation is also very important. The shorter the operation, the less the risk. There's an, an almost 30% risk in, for every hour that a procedure is longer by. So for every extra hour a procedure lasts, there's a 20 to 30% increased risk of infection. The use of prophylaxis, which is very important. Um, that should be administered at least an hour before the procedure. Use of drains to drain the fluid, the serous fluids or any blood that remains because these fluids usually act as a focus for in infections. When we look at patient related factors, most of them are related to immune, the immune status. So we're talking about age, hypothermia, we're looking at smoking, which also delays wound healing. We're looking at diabetes, which is a very immunosuppressive condition, HIV, especially if the CD4 count is not well maintained and the viral load is high. And then we also look at malnutrition status because malnutrition predisposes to infectious risks. When we look at microbiological factors, nasal carriage or skin carriage, we'll, we'll see later on how any procedures that might be conducted when the skin is contaminated 
or any neurosurgical procedures when the nasal carriage is contaminated allow the pathogens to enter into spaces where they'd not ordinarily be found and cause infection. The drug resistance has become a very big problem as we keep as we keep the conversation on antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, we know that increasing um, development of resistance, these organisms are found in our facilities, in our ICU spaces, in our surgical theaters, and they cause chronic or infections that are very difficult to treat. And we also have the length of preoperative admission. We know the hospital space is generally a very contaminated area. So the longer a patient stays in, in, uh, in the wards before they have their procedure, which is very common, especially in our public facilities, the more likely they are. Um, their spaces are likely to be contaminated. And if a septic technique is not used or proper wound cleaning, then they are likely develop infection. So why, is, uh, why are healthcare associated infections a problem? Why are we concerned about them? Why are we having this presentation? We put five, five things on the slide. And these are very significant things because we have prolonged hospital stay. Patients spend on average eight to 10 days, if they acquire healthcare associated infection, they spend eight to 10 days more within the hospital. Now, in the hospitals that don't have universal healthcare in Kenya, which is uh, basically all, and especially for the private hospitals, then it becomes a very big challenge because this means increased healthcare costs for the patients. The longer they stay there to manage them, there's increased cost for them. And we know in Kenya, a lot of patients are spending out of pocket. So this is a very big burden for them, especially because the infection is acquired within the hospital. Again, increased morbidities, increased mortalities, and long-term complications occur. When we talk about healthcare-associated infections, we like to classify them into four, and these are the most common. So we have surgical sites, uh, central line-associated infections, catheter-associated uh, urinary tract infections, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. So if you, if you take nothing away from this presentation, uh, then at least focus on this part because the care bundles are what we use to prevent healthcare associated infections. There are a set of uh, interventions that have been, uh, the, that evidence has shown that they prevent, they are very useful in the management and by management we mean prevention or at least minimizing the severity of infections that are acquired within the healthcare space. So we are going to have care bundles for each of the four classes that we showed. And these are the things that we, when we are at our facilities, we need to make sure that we emphasize and that these things are happening because then they reduce the occurrence of the infections. When you talk about surgical site infections in uh, lower and middle income countries, these are actually the most common infections that occur. They are closely followed by catheter associated, but surgical site infections are very, very common. In some places, it's as bad as one in every, for every three surgical procedures that are conducted, one ends up in an infection. And uh, if the infection is not managed appropriately, it could end up in, or, a very bad wound that uh, develops into a chronic wound and other long-term complications. So what is an SSI? It's basically an infection that occurs within 30 days after, after the operation. And usually, unless there's uh, an implant in place, if there's an implant in place, we can give it as long as 90 days. It may involve the skin and subcutaneous tissues, or it could go deeper and go as far as the uh, organ space. So these are areas that are usually manipulated during surgical procedures. So then we categorize them according to the layer of the skin that at which the infection is occurring. So here we have a pictorial that just uh, demonstrates what was in the last slide. 
So again, within 30 days, there's an implant within 90 days. We look at superficial deep and organ space. So it just depends on the extent of the surgery. And of course, the deeper the wound goes, the poorer the prognosis and the more likely the complication. So again, we can classify wounds. So that one was based uh, on the wound depth. Then additionally, we can also classify according to surgical wounds. And uh, usually we have clean wounds. Uh, Clean wounds usually have no inflammation and there's usually no organ space entry. So when we say, we talk about organ space, I'm talking about either the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal, gastrogenitourinary spaces. So as long as those spaces are not uh, contravened during surgery and there's minimal inflammation, minimal, no inflammation, then we consider it clean. There's a clean contaminated, then the uh, systems that I've just mentioned, are affected in the surgical procedure. For contaminated, we, we, we have usually have fresh but open wounds. So fresh is uh, even if there's an insult that has occurred outside the hospital, it has occurred within within 12 to 24 hours, within 12 hours of being of coming to the hospital. But infected wounds, we find that there's been a longer period where the patient has had either a chronic wound or a wound that already has a lot of devitalized tissue, that is necrotic tissue. So when it comes to the pathogens that we commonly see for exercise, and uh, the, this is what is worrying, is because you see some of them, they coagulase negative, um, and then we also have the Staph aureus and uh, the Saprophyticus species, they usually found after normal, normally my, normal micro, microflora on the surface of the skin. So this shows that the um, proper wound cleaning prior to uh, the onset of the surgical procedure is the issue, that it is the area is not being cleaned well enough. It's not being sterilized well enough prior to the beginning of the surgery. Then we can also see there are a lot of enterobacteria they're looking at E. coli, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, and these are commonly implicated, especially in drug resistance. And a lot of them have been found to be colonizing our hospital spaces, which is a, is a, is a push for more surveillance so that we can be able to manage these infections. When we look at the care bundles, these are things that they are very easy for us to do and hygiene, uh, I think that has become a song this year, but it's still very important that we continue to do hand hygiene and especially in theater, hand hygiene in the proper way and uh, to ensure proper aseptic technique pre-surgery. Effective antibiotic prophylaxis that should be done an hour and this should be informed by surveillance that has been conducted. So whether it's uh, you've been able to do culture and sensitivity, from swabs collected in theater or in the surgical wards where the patients are before and after surgery. It's very important that we are offering antibiotic prophylaxis relevant to the organisms that we have in our theaters and in our wards. Then minimal skin trauma related to hair removal. We know that patients are always shaved uh, prior to surgery. And it's important that the skin is not traumatized prior and during the removal. Normoglycemia is very important. Um, for allowing proper wound healing and maintenance of uh, nomothamia, which is also very important for um, humoral and cellular immunity. So additional risk minimization techniques. Uh, we spoke a lot about the surgeon and how important it is that his technique and uh, maintenance of hemostasis is maintained. Uh, again, uh, septic technique is very important and it must be maintained at all times. Right now in the COVID era, we are talking about people isolating when they are unwell, when they have COVID. But it's also important that people who are generally sick, maybe they have uh, coughs, colds, are generally kept away from the theater space because we know it's, 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 it's very normal for us to say we have a mild flu, but still be in theater operating. So this should not be the case. Additionally, during procedures, 
it's very important that the handling of the tissues during surgery is very gentle, avoid uh, destroying tissues extremely, maintain hemostasis, remove all the vitalized tissues, which are necrotic tissues. Proper wound closure with minimal tension is also very important. In addition to the aseptic technique, Uh, excuse me, Dr. Leon, if you could uh, increase your voice a little bit. Uh, thank you. Okay. Next, we go to central line associated bloodstream infections. And these are infections that occur where a central line has been placed. And this is uh, where a central line has been in place for at least two days and within. Uh, 72 hours at three days post removal and not related to infection at any other site. So it's basically a, around the duration where the central line has been put. It has been there for at least two days. Anything prior to that means it's unlikely that the infection has come is associated with the central line and anything after three days of its removal unlikely to be anything related to the central line. For the risk factors, we tend to have uh, two broad categorizations, and this is based on how the pathogens will find entry into the uh, bloodstream. So either the pathogens find entry through the lumen of the catheter or outside the lumen. So intralumen, intraluminally, we, it's either the operator who is uh, putting in whatever it is that is being, the central line is being used for, when it's being entered, either the operator is not maintaining proper septic technique, the closure of the port is not done properly, um, or the infusates that are going into the lumen are contaminated. And the other one is extraluminal. So we look at basically the patient's skin, and that is the area where the contamination is coming from. So especially during removal or uh, entry of the catheter when it's being inserted or when it's being removed. This is when the contamination takes place. Additionally, you could also have hematogenous seeding from another source, but this is uh, less common. So usually either this poor septic technique during insertion of the catheter or um, whatever the manipulation of the catheter while it's in place is poor and there's a lot of contamination going on with poor infection prevention. So when we, the common pathogens that are related to central line associated, see again, surface organ, sur skin surface organisms, cons organisms with its epidermidis, which is the most common or saprophyticus. We also see staph aureus and enterococci. And an organism that we don't commonly associate with infections in our hospitals, but candida is also showing to be a very strong candidate for most infections that occur in hospitals. So whether it's a um, urinary tract or even bloodstream, it's something that we should begin to look for more and more and to manage more and more. For the bundles, hand hygiene figures again, features again, sorry. Very important that uh, during manipulation of the of the catheter um, of the central line, sorry, during insertion, during removal, that hand hygiene is maintained, proper septic technique, uh, maximal barrier barrier precautions. You must use appropriate antiseptics for cleaning the skin. Uh, optimal catheter site selection. So basically, an area where there is not too much movement. Uh, you should try and avoid avoid areas where there are joints. And then daily review and a, cathed, a central line should be removed as soon as it is no longer necessary. It should be reviewed every day. And if it, if it is either not properly inserted, unnecessary, or there are signs of contamination, it should be removed. Next, we go to the catheter associated urinary tract infections. Catheters are things that we use very, very regularly in our facilities, but there's usually very poor management of catheters. Very little aseptic technique is maintained when inserting. Um, management of the catheter is usually left to the patient with uh, 
very poor monitoring. And subsequently, a lot of UTIs develop. So a, a urinary tract infection associated with catheter use that occurs at least two days after the catheter has been inserted. So entry points, again, we just look at all the areas where bacterial seeding can happen. So we look at the meatal junction where the, the, where the catheter is being inserted at the meatal junction. We look at the, the port for inflating the catheter. We look at where the catheter is connected to the urine bag. We look at where the urine bag is open to release the urine. So all these different areas must, we must ensure at all times that they are very well connected to avoid entry of pathogens from outside. And again, we must remember that the urine will provide a good hook. As much as urine is sterile and its action is usually flushing, if there are any areas where the urine is um, remaining, then provide a, provides a good focus for the onset of an infection, which then ascends into the urethra and other um, higher up in the genital urinary tract. Common pathogens that cause catheter-associated urinary tract infections are the same organisms that cause urinary tract infections. And most of them are Enterobacteria, such as E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Proteus. And these are commonly implicated in drug resistant. When we're talking about drug resistant organisms, we're mainly talking about this. These, um, and they are associated with the NDM gene resistance for Klebsiella. We have the uh, Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase that has become very, very significant because they are contributing a lot to morbidity and a lot of mortality. So these are the common organisms that we look for. And again, it is important to conduct sensitivity testing at proper facility. Do the cultures see what the, um, antibiotics they respond to? and then we are able to manage subsequently. For the care bundles, the most important thing, one is to check the clinical indication. Many times patients are on catheters when they did not need them, or they are not removed when they are no longer useful. So the patient stays with a catheter long after they require it. Again, if there's any blockage in the catheter, it should be removed immediately because the urine must flow continuously. Failure to this, but uh, anytime the urine accumulates, provides a good uh, focus for infection to grow from. Must be emptied regularly, and the urine bag should hang on. Should should be off the floor to avoid the uh, bag flow. Again, a septic technique must be used during catheterization. This is an area that is commonly missed, and proper hand hygiene before handling. Again, the catheter must be reassessed on an everyday basis for its indication and removed as long as it's no longer necessary. Same way we do with granulars, central lines, we must also do for catheters. Patients must also be made aware on how to reduce infection. The patient must, be, must take part in the management of the catheter at the same level as the healthcare worker. So for us, it's very important that the patient also knows how to ensure that he's maintaining the catheter properly, especially for those patients who use them long-term with uh, patients with benign prost prostatic hyper. Yeah, so that kind of thing. So the patient must also be a part of the process. Lastly, we come to ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, ventilators have become a very big part of the conversation, especially this year because of COVID. But more than just having the ventilator available and using it on a patient to save their life, so a common complication of use of a ventilator is the pneumonia that arises. And usually this pneumonia will result in, in death. The prevalence is, can be as high as 25%. So as, one, as high as one in four patients who are on a ventilator may end up developing pneumonia associated with ventilator use. So the patient should have been on ventilation for at least two days. And uh, the onset of the pneumonia can either be early, if it's within four days of insertion, 
of the ventilator or the intubation or after four days. So if early onset is associated with a better prognosis. So if late onset occurs, and usually the prognosis is quite poor and many times we lose the patient. So it's, of course, it's very common in ICU setups because this is where we normally use the ventilators. So when we look at the risk factors, the risk factors associated with the ventilator use are either associated with physiological disruptions that, for example, occur with age or with disordered consciousness where things such as uh, swallowing or uh, coughing, the reflex of coughing are altered. So then the patient is not able to work the mucus either to swallow it and even the ciliary action is, is inhibited. Again, we also have um, the longer a patient is on mechanical ventilation, the longer, the more the, the, more the ciliary action, the ciliary um, action on the mucus is inhibited. Again, they are usually, an, the ability to swallow effectively is impaired. So then there's also a lot of retention that provides a good focus for the infection to occur. Prolonged hospital stay, of course, is associated with um, is associated with increased interaction with the organisms. ICU spaces are actually places that are usually very heavily contaminated, and usually they are contaminated with drug-resistant microorganisms. Acinetobacter is one that has been commonly uh, found in ICU spaces. You're also talking about Klebsiella, E. coli. They're also quite common in pseudomonas. Uh, we also have smoking. So of course, smoking impairs ciliary function, so uh, reduces the ability of the cilia to scavenge on, on the mucus and intraabdominal hypertension. Um, the hypertension within the intraabdominal space will impair with the movement of the diaphragm, which will impair um, respiratory activity. I think I'd mentioned some of these organisms. These are, again, the, the very common pathogens that we'll find in uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So we have Enterobacteriaceae, and we also have an Acinetobacter, very common suspect and very difficult to treat for those who have worked in ICU spaces, and Staphorias with the uh, MRSA, and uh, also the uh, Vancomycin intermediate Staphorias are, are also becoming quite common, and they're causing a lot of mortalities within our ICU areas. For the care bundles, uh, what we attempt to do for ventilator associated patients on ventilators to minimize the pneumonia that results is to ensure that either the secretions will go into the dependent areas for reabsorption in the lower parts of the lungs, or we are able to perform suction as often as possible, and we are also able to minimize reflux from the gastrointestinal areas. So we tend, we, we advise to tilt the bed at 30 to 45 degrees, uh, similar for cardiac, the way we do for cardiac patients, so that the secretions can go into the dependent areas of the, the lungs or the pleural space, sorry. Then the sedation vacation. So again, so many times we find that we are putting these patients on <clears throat> sedation. And it's important that every once in a while, because when the patient is conscious, then they're able to conduct some, some physiological functions that they will, will work better. So it's important that we also give the sedation vacations. And again, we must continuously assess the use or the necessity of the um, ventilator. So if the patient no longer needs it or can uh, do fine on his own, then he should be extubated. Peptic ulcer prophylaxis is very important because this prevents a reflux, a reflux and aspiration that occurs, aspiration pneumonia. Then DVT prophylaxis because of the risk of the dislodging of the thrombi and the embolism that results. Then we must also continuously drain secretions and perform oral care to prevent even infections from developing within the oral cavity where the secretions are accumulating and providing a good focus and they because of, again, the poor ability to swallow, then the, they might end up in the respiratory tract. So those are the, the things that we must ensure as we keep our patients on the vents. For the healthcare worker, our work, as I mentioned, the most important thing here is really the bundle components. 
if you end up developing the infection, the, it's, it's, it might be too late for the patient. You might not have the right antibiotics. If you have, uh, you're have you working with a drug-resistant microorganism, you might do a lot, cost the patient a lot, and still lose them. So it's very important that our role is to prevent. And even for this series, we are doing infection prevention. So we're trying to prevent the infection. So follow the bundle components specific to your role. Again, work with your colleagues so that if they're missing certain steps, we all work as a team. And it's important that we uh, be our brothers keepers even at our facilities. We provide patient teaching. We've seen especially in, um, especially when the patients have granulars or catheters, it's very important that they are also aware of how to manage these devices so that they don't get contaminated. Document the patient education. Very important, we say what is not documented is not done. And it's very important to remind peers of the importance of following bundle components. So as I said, be your brother's keeper. The lessons that you pick up from here, others may not know, share, share with them. And ensure that everyone is compliant. So lastly, we talk about surveillance. Surveillance is systematic collection that is ongoing. And then we, the data that we collect, we analyze and interpret it. So we, we, we use this data to make decisions. When we are talking about microorganisms and infections within the facility, it's very important that we know what types of microorganisms do we have in our different departments. And secondly, what drugs are they sensitive to? Because this is what we use going forward. We will not do culture and sensitivity on every patient. But once you have a record, you know that an ICU patient with a UTI is likely to have this organism. So subsequently, we already know that it's sensitive to this medication. So we administer it. So that's really the plan. So that we know, we plan, and then we act when the, when the patient comes or when the infection occurs. Uh, types of surveillance we have targeted and you see high risk units such as ICU and I've, I've, I've highlighted the theater is also a high risk unit. This, these are areas where we can conduct targeted surveillance. We can also rely on passive surveillance from uh, lab records, healthcare worker reports and medical records. And active surveillance, usually this is if we are, we are, we are trying to do maybe a prevalent survey, a kind of study. So that one, that is not something that we would routinely do. But I would recommend for ICUs, we can do targeted surveillance every, with every so often, maybe once or twice a year, just to see what organisms we routinely have or not they're sensitive to. Passive surveillance is something that is very continuous, especially from relying on records from the lab. The purpose of surveillance, I think I've mentioned quite a few of them, but uh, it's very important to obtain baseline data. So we need to know where we are and see where it is that we are failing with our infection prevention. If you find very contaminated areas of the hospital, you know that either the, the, the cleaning, the sterilization procedures uh, are not happening appropriately and more can be done. They also help to identify the gaps. Then we evaluate some of the interventions that we put in place. Uh, we improve patient outcomes, which is the most important bit, and also prevent health worker infections because we know what we, we, we are at risk of. Monitor quality of infection control practices, educate healthcare providers, determine research and study needs. And um, especially for our labs, helps us to get accreditation. In summary, healthcare associated infections are a common cause of morbidity and mortality. They have a huge cost for both the hospitals and for the patients, um, and also for the health workers. And we are seeing that more and more. APC has really become an important part because of COVID and all the healthcare associated infections that we are seeing. The risks, is in, the risks are increased by poor management of invasive medical devices, all the classes of healthcare associated infections for the patients we've seen are related to medical devices. And this can be caused by the, by the patient because they are managing their 
the invasive device poorly or the provider because of poor septic technique, poor know-how on how to manage the device. So the objective of this whole uh, presentation is for us to use the set preventive care strategies within the hospital to ensure that risks for infection are minimized. We cannot stop the risks. We cannot end all the infections within the hospital, though that is always a goal. But it is important that we reduce it to uh, at least a manageable level because as it stands, there's uh, a lot of illness, a lot of strain to the patient, and a lot of death that is caused by poor IPC within the hospital spaces. Thank you. Asante, Asante Sana Daktari, uh, thank you for uh, the elaborate uh, presentation and uh, uh, guiding us through uh, uh, preventive ways to tackle nosocomial, nosocomial infections. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. We highly appreciate uh, the presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, I'll still remind you to kindly go to the Q&A section, eh? type in your questions. We're going to we're going to have a session where all these questions are going to be responded. We're going to have a plenary session where all these questions are going to be responded. So ladies and gentlemen, kindly go through, uh, uh, kindly allow yourself to type the question or if you have a comment, you can leave it at the chat box. Uh, this is to remind you still that the event is on the PPB portal. Uh, the event is on the PPB portal and the name of the event for today is IPC, uh, semicolon healthcare associated infections. That is the name for the event today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, without further much ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce the next, our next speaker for today. Our next speaker for today is the Dean School of uh, uh, School of Nursing and Midwifery at uh, Uma University. Our next Dean is school, uh, she's the Dean, uh, School of Nursing and Midwifery at uh, Uma University. She is a clinical nurse specialist and she is a member of the National Nurses Association of Kenya Education Committee. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, her name is Dr. Uh, Fatma. Her name is Dr. Fatuma, and she's going to take us through. Uh, she's going to take us through behavior change intervention in IPC. Behavior change inter intervention in IPC. Dr. Fatuma, are you with us? Yes, I am there. Thank you. Thank you. As Asante Sana, Doctor. Take share. us uh, through this uh, next presentation. Asante, Doctor. Are you able to see my slides? Uh, yes, I yes. can see your slides. Doris? Yes, Doris? Yes, uh, Dr. Fatuma, we can see the projection. Thank you. So I, I can go on, okay. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. I think it's already midday. As I've been introduced, um, I'm taking you through the module seven of uh, this infection control curriculum for health workers. And uh, the, our topic today of discussion is behavior change, uh, communication in infection control, infection prevention and control. Uh, for us to understand first from the general perspective, behavior is uh, an observable uh, actions that we can usually see or measure. And even the social psychologists say that when learning has taken place, you can observe from the individual behavior. Now that we have learned a lot, for the last one hour or so. I hope our behavior will change. Uh, let's move. By the end of this uh, module, uh, the learners are able to describe BCC uh, concept and its benefits. Uh, the learners are also able to outline the role of BCC in IPC, that's infection prevention control. And the learners are able to list behaviors that promote good IPC practices and the learners are able to list the behaviors that hinder implementation of IPC. And the learners are able or should be able to know by the end of the module that they're able to describe the strategies for improving behavior change in IPC. That is what we are as a human being by changing the inner attitude of our minds can we change the outer aspect of their lives? Which means which we develop a positive attitude and attitude is uh, 
a component of the attitude is the, our feelings, which is the thoughts, our cognitive knowledge, and the behavior that people can observe. And if we, we develop, then we're able to change the world. There, what is behavioral change communication? This is a strategy that triggers people, society, communities to adopt healthy, beneficial, and positive behavioral practices. BCC is an effective communication approach that helps promote changes in knowledge, attitude, norms, beliefs, and behaviors. BCC is also an interactive process within the community. If you want to develop programs in a way it's tailored to them, you can pass the message and people are able to utilize using various channels of a communication which is suitable to your audience. And it's, they're able to pick up the behavioral change. Apart from picking up the behavioral change, our aim is not just to pick up the behavioral change. We, are, we need to internalize, prepare, and sustain the positive attitude. Um, why is it important to have BCC? So it's important, one, it helps us to trigger and stimulate people to for adopting positive behavioral approaches. Uh, BCC also promotes appropriate and essential attitude change. Attitude change is very important. When we, when we get the knowledge, we have the feeling and the thoughts to make us change and therefore it's demonstrated on our behaviors. It's quite important for us as health workers. Uh, as BCC strategies and messages are tailored for specific target group, for instance, now, whatever we have been passing over, the knowledge you have been learning on IPC is targeted for our health workers. Therefore, we are able to develop certain strategies which are efficient and effective for us so that we control and prevent infections. Uh, BCC approaches are more suitable and acceptable. It also improves the aptitude and feelings of self-adequacy. So that is the importance of BCC, then how do we apply uh, BCC in infection uh, prevention or in the context of IPC? As healthcare workers uh, at the individual level, healthcare personnel should have the necessary knowledge in which we are trying to disseminate knowledge now on infection prevention. In the morning, we have learned about waste management and we went to learn again hay and now we are, since we have achieved a certain knowledge, we believe and we assume that by the end of this module, uh, our health workers have been equipped with knowledge. Assumably, they also had passed their courses before and they had it before. And therefore we are trying to stimulate and build more knowledge uh, in infection control and the ability to implement effective and infection control practices. Uh, we also increase uh, knowledge based on healthcare workers by influencing their perception and motivate them to change behavior. So for our change to occur, of course, we need to motivate the health workers and see the perception. Like the pharmacist, now you're in the community. How would you want to work with the community and inform them that you cannot just give them antibiotics because we usually follow the antimicrobial stewardship. We understand it. We must have evidence based for people to be prescribed for drugs. And therefore it's up to you people to teach the community using uh, a channel that is suitable to them and acceptable to them, that it's not good just to come and ask for drugs, antibiotics on and off. And therefore there's a rational use. And we sort of set standards that uh, we, cannot we cannot give out these drugs unless you have a prescription from authorized prescriber and such. So those are the things which will help us. So as you are the community workers, you're able to teach the community why you are doing what you're doing so that they're able to understand. The other thing is the increasing knowledge based, uh, no, when the healthcare workers assess their behavior towards IPC, if there are changes to occur, which outweighs the cons and pros, then one is ready to adopt the positive uh, behavior. Of course, of lately we have seen not, not even health workers because of the COVID, 
each and every Kenyans are masking up. I don't know if they use the right mask or the right way, but everybody has a mask on the street. I don't know whether it's the fear of the police or it's individual that who is taking care of their health. And they sanitize their hands. There they are. Some of them probably keeping distance. So it has become, the, the abnormal has become normal for us because wearing masks was only for health workers. But now the health workers, even the public understands it just because the information was passed and people understand that we need to prevent diseases by using proper PPEs. Uh, so the use of uh, skill building or peer group modeling and champions. So we need to have a champions of IPC as we are some of us, we are champion for IPC, for behavioral change. Each and every uh, section of healthcare workers, like now the pharmacist, you can have the champions for IPCs so that um, each and everybody understands when you're entering your pharmacy, you need what you, you, are, you know what you're supposed to do. Like you need to clean up your hands before handling the medication, where to store them proper way. How do you handle at the compounding area of drugs when you're doing those specific preparation for specific patient, the protocols, the rules and regulations and all that. There you if we get people to champion for it and then we shall have a cultural change across and we teach each other. So those are some of the applications. So uh, let me know, sorry, I'm going back to. So reflection on personal behavior change in IPC. So as, as healthcare workers, first you think of yourself as an individual. Am I the source of infection? Think, are you the source of the infection? Who is contaminating, not using proper uh, cleaning of hand hygiene? not using the protocol that's laid out for a health workers in the institution, are you the source? You question yourself, that's a reflection. When you want to change a behavior first, you think through it. You start contemplating it. Then you start prepare, preparing it. And then you do the action. And after the action, now you sustain the action. And therefore the first key thing is to think yourself, am I the source of the infection? How is it? How is my adherence to IPC protocol? Am I adhering to protocol? Am I washing my hands before the procedures? We, uh, after the procedures, before leaving the premises, before handling from one medication to another? How am I packing these drugs? Am I following, am I storing these drugs in the right way? You know, some of those questions, the IPC protocol, how do you dispose even those uh, expired drugs? Where do you keep them? What's your role as, a, as an IPC champion? So what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? You question yourself. Am I willing to change my behavior? What will be the consequences of my behavior in the prevention of infection? What will, the, what will be the consequences of my behavior change before for the others institution within the institution to your co-workers, to your families and friends. Of course, when you're in the health institution and you have been handling infectious thing and you want to go back home, how will you handle your members? Like now we have the COVID, how will you interact with your people? How, what will you do when you have the science? You know, Are we following the quarantine? All those questions you ask yourself, who are you protecting? Are you protecting yourself? Are you not protecting your colleagues? Are you protecting uh, your family, friends? So we need to question ourselves, whatever we are doing. What will, what will my reaction be to my new self? So you have to think because we are changing behavior. How are we going? When we change, how shall we act? Uh, like, you know, nowadays, let's say like we have this COVID running away all over our country. We know it's a pandemic and probably you're not feeling well. How will you interact with your colleagues? Because sometimes COVID has also some stigmas with us. So how will you, how will you act as oneself? If you want to teach, will you go and hug everybody? I don't know. You have to question your family members. If you have the illness within you, how do you, what is, what, do, what are you going to do as a new person, a changed person, uh, a champion of IEPC? How do we handle infections to prevent infections? 
what what will the reaction of the others be? So if I isolate myself, I tell, ah, ah, don't shake my hands, don't hug me. How will the others feel? What my new self? So you start contemplating, questioning, and thinking through who you are. Behavior Excuse that promotes. Me. Yes, yes. Sorry for interruption. Would you mind uh, putting your presentations in a slideshow mode? All right. Is that okay? I think I did. Yes, yes, that's okay. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, so behavior that promotes good IEPC practices. So all healthcare workers have appropriate knowledge in IEPC. And there's a belief that when there is knowledge, the person has knowledge, there's that inner motivation that there's a change in their behavior. Uh, though there are other motivational uh, factors that may influence and the only requirement to address is the attitude that leads to appropriate practice that include deliberate choice to adopt healthy practice in IPC. You deliberately, cognitively think, you went through thinking and you say, yes, I'm going to adopt this practice. Adherence to the set of standards of infection control, promoting evidence-based practice. As I've just said, you don't prescribe, give drugs without evidence-based. So you must have a rational use of the antimicrobial agents. Peer evaluation and monitoring of IPC practices, reward system for excellence practice. This we can sometimes in the institution of healthcare, uh, maybe our employers can sometimes see how someone is working so hard to ensure that infection is controlled within the setting. You see, like if you're in the clinical areas, let's say in the ICUs, we can have the cameras, we can monitor our staffs, how they're interacting, who is following this, who's coming to job. Then by the end of the month, probably we evaluate and see which staff have been actually adhering to the protocol, like the hand washing before, after, in procedures, how they're handling the others, how they were wearing their PPEs, and then probably we, we, we reward them. So you know behavior with a consequent reward is that aspect of sustaining that behavior, that desirable behavior and people practicing it. Continuous professional development is also very important as we are doing today. We are trying to develop our colleagues, remind them some of this information or stimulate them to go and read further. So from here, we just need to exercise and remember uh, five strengths you possess as a healthcare worker that improved IPC implementation in your workplace. That's a question to your mind. Behavior that hinder IPC among healthcare workers. Uh, why do you think we have a problem to adopt IPC in our institutions? There are many reasons, many factors surrounding. One of it is poor knowledge in, on IPC. People don't realize the importance. They don't realize, they don't want to waste time washing hands. So sometimes there's no water, the water point is far and you know, all that. Masking up, mask is not always available. Uh, Googles, because you want to go prepare medication. You, you have no time for this, absolutely. Because sometimes probably we don't understand the magnitude of the chemicals we are handling. We actually don't bother so much, maybe our cognitive mind, whether it's knowledge, whether it's our attitude, uh, we just continue. So it's poor knowledge, poor attitude toward IPC. You don't see it, attitude, our perception. So we perceive there's no need. And I, as I told you, our attitude is, is, has a three main component. That is our thoughts and feelings, our emotional feelings. We have our cognitive, which is consistent of our knowledge and then our behavior. So if any of that is a compromise, then we may not achieve IPCs. Poor work morals. People always say uh, they go to work just because they want to see uh, some little pay. They are demoralized. So by the time they go there, they just march into the chemist or their pharmacy they're working in. They give out the drugs. Just take your medication. You know, the way sometimes our attitude, 
we just we don't even care of ourselves before caring for the others. So that probably because of the morals, morals. So we have low morals to our work, poor work culture. Yeah, it's uh, that's what we are trying to change culture. Culture is the main thing that we have to work against if we need to achieve IPC in our community and in our in our health in our health facility. Poor uptake of evidence-based findings. If we are not updated with the current studies which are done of what we are practicing, therefore we may be practicing the old thing, outdated information, and we don't expect it to work. So then this is another exercise for you to think through the practices in IPC that you need to change as a healthcare worker. Consequences of ignoring behavior modification in infection control. Basically, if we ignore to change to a desirable behavior that controls and prevents diseases from us, our families, and the whole community, then one of the problems we have is poor adherence to IPC practice. So there's no practice, poor infection control outcomes. So the disease will spread random uh, all over to us. It becomes pandemic. We don't care. So we spread from one household to the other and it moves around. Or from one, from the pharmacy to the wards, to the casualty, uh, to the labs, you know, we just mix up and we spread that uh, infection. And the outcome is many healthcare, healthcare workers uh, who are losing their life. We have no people to attend to the sick patient. It's going to be expensive in the long run. Poor advocacy for IPC practices. So no one bothers to advocate for IPC. No one tells you we need to follow protocol and practice one, two, three. No one, no one sees that IPC is everyone's business because when you practice, uh, uh, when you practice the guidelines and protocol to make sure that uh, you adhere to IPC protocol, because you are not not only protecting others, you're also protecting yourself. So adverse patient outcome. So patient outcome will be poor because remember we have also learned before now hospital acquired infections, which is associated also with healthcare workers who are spreading it from one patient to another. Poor perception of risk of hate dissatisfied healthcare workers and clients. Because if most healthcare workers are dying because of the disease, of course, the people are dissatisfied. People will not even feel to go and work in hospitals. Because you can even hear some Kenyans when they have seen people dying, they're saying, oh, I wish I cannot take my child to go and do a healthcare course because healthcare workers are dying. They are frontline people. So those are some of the consequences. Systematic method of BCC application in IPC. One is we need to understand the behavior that we are trying to change. Two, we set up a framework that points to the types of intervention that are likely to be effective. So we need to think which options do we have to, to, to introduce or to change this behavior. And then we consider these rays of options. We see these options, many of these options. And then we use the systematic method for selecting behavior change. So basically, as we use BCC, we think of the problem solving techniques, which we start with, like you identify or know the problem, you diagnose this problem, you have alternatives uh, solution to the problem, and then you plan, you pick up one, you implement and then you evaluate. So the same thing happens in when we are trying to use uh, BCC in IBC. So intervention, first thing as an intervention, the first thing we say is which behavior to start with? Which one do we want to change? Perhaps we want to make sure that everybody who enters the pharmacy need to wash their hands as one thing. So if I wash, if I, if I change this, what is likely impact? How easy is it to bring about change? Preference, acceptability, cost, you evaluate. You I mean, you think of this behavior you want to start. If it's washing hands, now you have to think through because you need the water, you need the soap. Where do you want to put it? You know, uh, then when people wash their hands, do you have something to dry them up? Do you have the dryers? Is it the sanitizer you can put in state? Which one is cheap for you? Which is cost effective? You, you try to think before you 
you make the interventions. Then you try to understand this behavior in the context. Why are these, why? Why are their behaviors as they are? Why do we have this? Why do we need this desire? Why do we wash our hands? How do we wash our hands? Do we just wash it or do we follow um, a certain uh, steps that we need to wash our hands? What does it benefit? What if we don't wash? You know, now we try to understand this behavior in the context of IPC. And then you make the behavioral diagnosis, like the source of the behavior. One, you know that the capability, the people who are supposed to pick up this behavior capability, physical and psychological ability to enact behavior, e.g., I guess probably nurses, because I'm a nurse. Nurses have a capability to clean their hands. So now in this context, the pharmacists who are entering this pharmacy and giving us the drugs or preparing these drugs for us have the ability to clean their hands physically and psychologically. They are set to do that, the capability. The other thing we think through is the motivation, automatic mechanism to activate behavior, like persuasive posters encouraging uh, the patient to ask questions, like each and everywhere when you're entering the pharmacy, you put a posters stop, wash your hands, you know, such thing. It's just at the entry, people understand that when you enter, you need to wash. Then the next stop, stop, wear up your PPP, something like that, you know, something that motivates and persuades the people. And then when you have a champions that always encourage you, and then it's picked up. Opportunity, the physical and social environment that enables behavior, like alcohol-based rap, see now, I cannot just tell you to be washing your hands, use alcohol, if it's not being provided. So the environment itself should be conducive, should, not allow, should allow the practice of IPC to maximum. So interventions, intervention is activities are designed to change behavior. So if you need to change this behavior and we need to sustain it, so we need to supply the alcohol-based hand wrap. So we need also to have job aids, we need to do, have frequent training and reminders of ourselves. We need to disseminate the current information, evidence-based information, so that we, we maintain and sustain the behavior. Strategies for improving BCC in IPC, training of health workers, CPDs, which we are doing today, provide the necessary resources. Uh, hopefully where you're working, the necessary resources are there. Good fac facilitation of IPC procedures, that is enabling environment, which I said that you must have the necessary things, the resources. Reinforcing appropriate behavior demonstrated by the healthcare workers. So reinforcing is where now you reward behaviors. So when you reward and people understand the consequences of good behaviors, there's likelihood of repeating the same behaviors and sustaining the desirable behavior. And if people believe that this behavior associated with punishment, there's a likelihood of people uh, avoiding that behavior and then with distinct such undesirable behaviors. So create champions and supply party system, carrot or stick, we use the positive reinforcement, motivate incentive and change of healthcare workers' behaviors. In summary and conclusion, it is the responsibility of healthcare workers to take precautionary measures to prevent and control the spread of infection in the workplace. This involves working safely to protect themselves, other staff, visitors, individuals from infections. Employers must carry out risk assessment to assess the dangers of certain work activities and then are responsible for putting strategies in place for minimizing or eradicating the risk. And employers must provide resources, training, refresher update on infection control prevention. Thank you for listening and I hope we change our behavior we become a good champion of IPC where we are working, teach others, take care of ourselves, care for the ones around us. Thank you. Asante, Asante Sana, uh, Dr. Rifatma, uh, for guiding us to elaborate in that presentation. Thank you very much, Asante, for that.
uh, wonderful presentation on behavior change. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move to our plenary session. We have less than uh, we have less than ten minutes uh, before uh, our session ends today. Uh, I will I will now welcome uh, Eric Kitangala, who's going to take us through the plenary session. Eric. Uh, thank you very th thank you very much, Dr. Terry, for that. Asante Sana and Asante Sana, all the presenters. That one was very good and quite articulated. So at this time, without further ado, I want to go straight to the, to the questions that had been asked, though most of them have been responded to. So we may not need to respond to them. So I'll just flag out a few that I was thinking we could, um, the specific panelists said, would address them. So I'll just go straight to number one. Uh, Frida Kosgei had asked, is HAIs same as nosocomial? So I think Dr. Ogoti can lead us in that. And then for the bundles, uh, compliance, uh, what would be the best way to audit? So again, for the bundles, uh, what would be the best way to audit bundles at the facility level? So I think Dr. Ogoti also, that one is yours. And then uh, Sharon asked, this uh, This event is not on the PPB uh, portal. It is there. I think somebody has already answered that. And then there was a question from Neha. She's been asking how to use chlorine tablets and dilute them. And I think uh, this one will go to Karega. Karega can probably respond to that. And then also there's a question on how to dispose of uh, radio pharmaceuticals. I think Karega, you can respond to that. And then Frida also asked, how can we uh, dispose of expired drugs? And I think also Karega can respond to that. So I think the two, uh, Karega and Dr. Gochi, can respond to the questions and then we can move forward. Thank you. Maybe I can start off. Huh? Uh, I, 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 tried to, uh, yes, I, I tried to answer those questions. Uh, through the chat box, I try to answer them. There's that one that uh, from Neha, where she asked uh, uh, ask about chlorine tablets and how to use them and dilute them. I have indicated and how to calculate them because uh, you treat it like a powder and uh, you will have the concentration from the manufacturer. Uh, then the other one was about uh, the radio pharmaceuticals. I've said it's very important to do it through the lab field. Yes. So I have uh, categorically explained that yes. uh, it's a responsibility of the, here comes the responsibility of the association, the regulator, the society, and also the companies that produce these drugs. Because uh, the radio pharmaceuticals are supposed to be done through a lab field, a deep one, where they're supposed to make sure that uh, these things are in combustible, and maybe in the future they are not a risk to the to the public. So it's a, an expensive for a costly affair, and that's why we need the effort and the coordination of both the societies and the association. Though since we cannot uh, be, we don't have the capacity to be doing it in our facilities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Dr. Ogochi, if you could respond to the two. Hello, Dr. are you with us? Yes, 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 I am. Okay, thank you. Uh, so th thank you uh, for the participants for being with us with the presentation and I hope they've been able to learn a lot. To Frida's question, yes, uh, nosocomial infections are those that are acquired within the hospital space. For David's question on whether uh, on bundle compliance and the best way to audit, so usually we have, uh, when it comes to audit, it's very, it's, it's contextual. So it depends on where you are, what the kind, the kind of administrators you're working with, the kind of colleagues you have, the kind of committees you have in place. So all those things have an, uh, also go into the decision making process on how to conduct an audit. But for, but there's usually a standard uh, cycle that we use so the first thing is whatever it is. So for example, here we are looking at care bundles. We might 
want to start with care bundles, for example, to be used in the surgical department and in and the procedures related to uh, surgery. So whether it's in theater, whether it's in the ma major theater, minor theater, side room procedures, all these things. So first of all, you must choose a topic which you want to audit. And uh, ideally you should be setting the standards, but most standards exist. So you don't really need to start setting your own standards. You can adapt what exists either globally or locally from the national, or even some counties have also set their own standards for certain things such as IPC, whether it's AMS, as antimicrobial stewardship. So then you're using this at the hospital level to determine, to compare to what it is because the standards are what you should be doing. So then the next thing is to look at what is currently happening. So of course now this will also require the support of administration, will require committed people in the hospital team who are very interested in that the project to sit down and actually collect data vis-a-vis -vis the standard and see what the gaps are, if there are gaps or whether nothing is really happening in that in that area and what challenges exist. Then from after you collected the data, then you want to see, preferably you start with what we like to call low-hanging fruit. So what changes can you make that a low resource because that makes the administration happy, that are easy to implement to avoid the people who the implementers getting fatigued, especially if there's no motivation. So you just look, look at that, you're able to analyze the problem based on the data and to see how to implement uh, some of the changes. So that requires both the buy-in of the staff and the buy-in of the administration. Then continually check for improvements as you're implementing. So it's a slow process, but the thing with, is uh, if it's not standard practice to do audits and uh, to monitor for quality, then you it's better to just start working before you try and run. A lot of our facilities, especially those who work in public facilities, good practice is, is not common. It's not, it's not common at all. And, the, and we don't even audit to see what are the consequences of the failure to follow the set standards and criteria. And then it's, it's, it's basically a cyclical thing because after you've completed a project, you see that there are still many gaps. Then you keep repeating until you're able to perfect whatever it is that you, you are trying to do. So whether it's care bundles in surgery, whether it's in ICU, whether you're trying to do surveillance, whatever it is, that's, that's pretty much the, the way that it should be, that you should go about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc, for that. Now, Fatima, just put on your mic and answer this one in one second. Eh? Yeah, for behavior yeah. change, which is the best way? Is it negative reinforcement or positive reinforcement? Quick answer. Positive reinforcement. <laughs> Thank you very much, Fatma, for giving us that very quick answer. So we are going to depend on positive reinforcement. So due to time, we are we are actually remaining with two minutes. I'll say thank you very much for all the participants and also uh, thank you to the panelists for answering the questions. So I'll take it back to Mbau, uh, probably for the final remarks and inviting the person who's closing for us. So thank you very much and uh, all the best. Asante, bye. Asante Sana, Elik Tangara, thank you very much for leading our plenary session. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will remind you that uh, uh, the event is on the Pharmacy Business Board portal. Ensure that you subscribe. For the previous event, for the last week, uh, we have not yet we have not sent the tokens. They have been sent. They have been sent. They are in the course of being sent. So by end of next week, we shall have sent all tokens that we owe our members. Ladies and gentlemen, remember tokens are only valid eh, for tokens are only valid for. Uh, bona fide and up-to-date members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Uh, without further much ado, ladies and gentlemen, I want to call upon uh, our, our great partner who has been with us and uh, who, who, has, uh, who has worked with us at the journey of IPC. The Live Alone IPC, they have also been with us in other journeys and they have been of, of, of tremendous support. So I want to call upon Doris Botta from USAID uh, to come and give the vote of thanks from the USAID side and also uh, to probably give us uh, and tell us which other training are they are they planning for us? Uh, Doris, what are you with us? 
Uh, yes, I'm with you, Mbao. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Doris Botta, and I work for USAID MTAPS. Uh, it's a pleasure to have been with the uh, PSK since yesterday. Uh, yesterday, we covered about four modules. We talked uh, how to lay foundations for infection prevention and control. Then we talked about hand hygiene. occupational health and safety. So basically, infection prevention and control is key to prevention of infections, and we cannot overemphasize We have seen it with the current COVID-19 pandemic that we have the correct strategy. The USAID MTAPS will continue to collaborate with PSK, not in terms of infection prevention and big Dr. Jaguka Collins. So it's just the beginning of more collaboration with the association. So thank you so very much for having us and we truly appreciate that we have seen with the team here today. Um, Bao, and thank you so uh, much. Doris. Good afternoon, everyone. Asante Sanadoris for the... Uh, uh, the collaboration that you have had and our members are glad and happy that we have we've, we've had the training. So ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya uh, and respected seniors of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, uh, without further much ado, let me welcome a member of the National Executive Council, and that is none other than Dr. Anis Rahim Tula to give his vote of thanks as we wind up. Dr. Anis, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly well, Dr. Anis. Great. I want to share a story with you, uh, which uh, kind of uh, summarizes what we've been talking of uh, over the last two days. So uh, a few weeks ago, the, the doctor, the pharmacist, the nurses, and the, uh, the, they were having a, a conference. And each of them were talking about how, who is the most important person in the healthcare industry. So the doctor said, um, it has to be me because I'm the one who makes the diagnosis and I'm the one who, who tells you, the nurse, and you, the pharmacist, what to do. So the, the, the nurse said farewell. Um, and then the, the nurse said, I think it should, be, it should be the nurse because it's the nurse who makes sure that the care is given to the patient and uh, the, 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 the instructions that you give are carried out because you can give instructions, but if they're not carried out, that patient will not, it will not fare well. So the pharmacist and the farm tech not to be left behind said, fine, but what would you do without the medication? If we gave you the wrong medication or we told we did not look up for interactions, how would you survive? So all this time there was a, a cleaner who was uh, listening to all these conversations uh, from the housekeeping team and they said, if you really want to see who the most important uh, member of this team is, we are going to stop our services and you know the rest. So thank you very much. These presentations were very good. Uh, they were very comprehensive and uh, it's a, a good start. And uh, I hope the pharmacists and the farm techs who are listening are going to see why it is important to you uh, as a pharmacist or as a farm tech to have the correct infection control practices and uh, when you are communicating, you communicate to the level in the language that they understand. So it is a task to take all the material that you have been presented with and communicate that at the right level. Uh, it is also important that we keep up with technology and if uh, our methods of infection control are changing, we're able to communicate that effectively within our setup. We should also look at uh, the the effect of COVID as a health, uh, as a hospital acquired infection and uh, how to measure it and how to stop it. Uh, and uh, also make sure that the theory that we are giving is, is converted to practice because uh, we can talk all we want, but if we don't practice, uh, we will not get an end result. And just like when we treat uh, patients with uh, antimicrobial agents for internal purposes, 
It's the same with infection control practices. We need to use the right disinfectant for the right purpose in the right dose with the right time. So with those uh, closing remarks, uh, I say thank you very much to all the presenters. You have, had, you have made a really, really good presentations. Keep up the good work and thank you to USAID for this uh, uh, presentation and we look forward to doing more this, of this kind of work with you in the future. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon. Sante sana Dr. Anis. Ladies and gentlemen, Lilibe no mwanzo lazima liwe na mwisho. Langu sina mengi ila kuambia kuwa shukuru kwa pa shukrani zangu kwa kuwa nasi kutoka mwanzo hadi tamati ya hili somo. Asante ni sana kwa kuja na uh, kwa kujiunga pamoja nasi jioni hili uh, mchana huo. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. Asante. Have a great 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 uh, great afternoon. Thank you very much Dr. Jacqueline Kafugo kama for joining us this morning Dr. James Masibo Asante ni sana Dr. Grace Mbitiru all the way from Meru Asante ni sana. And if I don't mention you not because I don't know you but because I say uh, Asante ni sana uh, all our seniors and all other health, uh, allied health professionals who have been able to join us uh, today. Can you remember, subscribe to the event on the PPB photo. It only lasts till today, uh, uh, today, 12 at midnight. Please, please, ladies and gentlemen, subscribe to it. Dr. David Kiretai, kindly subscribe to the event on the PPB photo. If you don't subscribe to it today, we will not be able to assist you after this. So ladies and gentlemen, ensure that you subscribe to the event on the PPB portal. All CPD tokens uh, that we owe you, uh, we shall be able to have uh, give awarded them by 11th of, uh, of uh, December, all CPD tokens that we owe you till today. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to say a query and uh, you can leave a kind word to our panelists. They are able to uh, view your chats and I'll close the meeting officially at 1.10. Kwahiri ni sana, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being a uh, part of us today, Kwahiri. Ladies and gentlemen, these are uh, uh, presentation, these curriculum and PowerPoint presentations were developed in collaboration with all professional associations, including the Clinical Office Association, the Kenya Medical uh, Laboratory Scientific Officers, the Kenya Pharmaceutical Association, the Kenya Medical Association, uh, that is KMA, Kenya Society for Physiotherapists, and the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, and, and also the nursing, National Nursing Association of Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, Kwahirini Sana, Dr. Douglas Wero, Asante Sana for your sentiments. Our senior, Dr. Spencer Chiang, Asante Sana, Asante.